great deal of symbolism has gone into the planning and execution of the program tonight. Uh, the flag that will be posted here in the main dining hall uh, in a very conspicuous place in the center of the stage is a small handkerchief-sized American flag. Uh, this flag will be posted in the center arch of the stage. It was hand-woven by Colonel John Dermacy of Tacoma, Washington, while Colonel Dermacy was a POW in Vietnam. Of course, it was strictly forbidden, so the colonel had to work in private and in secret as much as he could. He made this flag, the small handkerchief-sized flag, by taking red strings from some of his long handle underwear. He used some gold trim from a blanket to weave into the flag. He used some string from a Red Cross package that he received from home uh, also to go into the small flag. And he used a small piece of scrap copper as the needle to sew this flag together. Of course, he could not fly it except at nighttime because had his POW captives realized that uh, the colonel had an American flag, he would have never gotten by with it and they would have collected it. He still had it when he was finally released. Finally tonight, as we look back at this Memorial Day weekend together, I want to tell you about something that happened that will probably never happen again. Forty years ago, the Vietnam War was ended by President Nixon, and hundreds of prisoners of war came home after years of brutal captivity. So the Nixon Library decided over the weekend to invite the former prisoners still living to recreate a dinner held at the White House long ago. And tonight, in America Strong, some of those POWs sit down with us to remind a new generation what courage and country really mean. They were the ace pilots shot out of the sky, taken prisoner and tortured by the Vietnamese, shoulders pulled out of sockets, burned with electric wires, and not for weeks, but years. Captured November the 7th, 1967, and there for 1,955 days. 2,103 days in the prison camp. 1,900 days in prison. And 40 years later, they still recognize the squeaky gate from that prison hell. They're coming for somebody, and it ain't good. They beat my good friend to death over the first month on his wounds. Captain Guy Gruder says as he listened to the screaming, he knew his only choice was to ask God to teach him how to forgive. I got on my knees heavy, and after three months of heavy prayer, real heavy prayer, I'm talking hours a day, I could finally form just in my mind the words, you know, Lord, uh, forgive them. I was praying for them, praying for the captives. That's the G. Through their prison walls, the they tapped letters to each other for God bless you. you, and came away with lessons about what courage really is. What is it? Courage is fear that has said its prayers. None of us was as strong as we wanted to be or we thought we would be. Courage is not always, the, you know, the end of the fight. Uh, courage is a process. When they returned to America in 1973, they were so thin, the U.S. sent tailors to remake their uniforms before they appeared in public. I bounded up the stairs and stopped at the top. <laughs> Blow them a kiss. <laughs> 
That's John McCain, and right behind him, Colonel Ellis, who says they got on the plane, he was handed a big cigar and hugged a nurse. We had not seen a woman in five and a half years. Can you imagine that? And Captain Gruters, who seemed so subdued on the flight home, soared in a dance of joy at the sight of his little brother all grown up. The son of a gun is stronger than I am. I can't believe it. This kid that I beat up all my life is now strong, and I can't believe it. And then there they were on the lawn of the White House for dinner with the president. And then last Friday, 187 of them, nearly a third of the original group, gathered again at the Nixon Library, remembering when brotherhood was everything in the distant memory that is Vietnam. What is it you most want to say to each other? A lot of people only have five or six friends that they can really count on in a tough situation. But we had 300 friends that we knew would take not just death for each other, but torture for each other. Torture is much harder to take than death. And we had 300 friends like that. In prison, they wrote down songs about America on toilet paper. They hid it from the Vietnamese. And 40 years ago, they sang one of them, written in prison. It is called the POW Prayer, about honor and freedom and home. O oh God, to Thee we lift our prayer and sing. O oh God, to Thee we raise the prayer and sing. From within these foreign prison walls, we're meant to wear the gold and silver wings and proudly heed our nation's call. Give us strength to withstand all the harm at the hands of our enemy, captain and loot. To inflict pain and strife and deprive every life of the rights they know well we are due. We salutes them back. Well, I'm going to ask a question of everybody here. Um, anybody come here today driving a 1962 Cadillac? Anybody? Why do I ask that question? Because the last B-52 rolled off the assembly line in Wichita, Kansas in 1962. It still flies now and it's going on its 60th year. And the re-engineing program starts this year, 2023. <clears throat> it's going to last a few years and that airplane will fly till 2060. It will be physically 100 years old. And it'll still be a first-line combat machine. That's what's amazing. <clears throat> okay, um, as you heard a little bit about linebacker too. And look at the audience here. I know a couple of gentlemen here also flew in linebacker mm -hmm. and uh, flew G models, flew D models, Guam, Utapau, Okinawa, Okinawa. Okay. Who else? Anybody flying linebacker? And where were you? What did you do? Well, no, I was at Dyes. I just flew out of Dyes then. Okay. On, on D models? On D models. Okay. So I spent a year over there in the KC, one, not KC, the 130s. In 130s, okay. Well, I always like to ask here what the experience level is, and I gear my talk a little bit about um, uh, 
the experiences that some people had in theater, but also knowing that sometimes we have some very junior people and you kind of have to explain a little bit about the airplane. I don't get very technical, but um, we'll talk a little bit about the D model, the G model, differences, and they were very, very different airplanes. It was very easy for President Nixon in March of 1972 to order additional uh, instrument capability to put bombs on the target in Vietnam. This was the rainy season. The tactical fighters couldn't handle the load. And we'd withdrawn most of our ground forces from Vietnam by 1972. The uh, U.S. Navy and the U.S. Air Force were providing air support to the ARVIN, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, in the field. Why well, about October, and I had deployed end of July, a brand new first shiny lieutenant coming out of training at Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota, and <clears throat> on a crew, I'm headed over to Guam, 1st of August. 23 August, there had been peace talks going on in Paris with Lee Doc To, the Politburo member of North Vietnam, and <clears throat> the uh, National Security Advisor, Dr. Henry Kissinger, who is still alive, by the way. I think he's 99. And he came out and said on the 23rd, he thought peace was at hand. Well, little did we know. The North Vietnamese were basically trying to revisit agreements that had been made over the course of months, trying to re-wicker them and ultimately they were probably looking at what the national mood was within the United States, which particularly wasn't uh, uh, positive for staying around in South Vietnam. So I think they thought they could just wait it out and not come to an agreement. So President Nixon ordered the remaining D models, about 50, we had 50 in theater at Utapau and in Anderson Air Force Base, Guam. Utapau's on the southern part of Thailand. It's a Royal Thai Navy base. And he ordered 100 B-52 G models into Guam and the remaining D models. So we had about 200 airframes committed to Southeast Asia. That was half the fleet, the B-52 fleet, and we had almost 300 air crews committed to Southeast Asia. That was three quarters of the air crews. And in this picture you see about half of those 150 B-52s at Guam at Anderson Field. Uh, you have here basically the uh, north row, the center row, and the south row is where they were parked on the field. And there's the D and the G. The D model was optimized for Southeast Asia. It um, weighed 450,000 pounds max gross weight takeoffs. Uh, dry wing, I mean, didn't have any fuel in the wings. Had, um, external load you can see here under the wings you can see bombs hanging off the external racks it had been optimized for southeast asia with what was called a big belly mod and it could carry 108 500 pound bombs both internal and external or 66 750s internal and the 500s external the g model on the other hand oh well, you also notice here it's painted black. It was kind of an anti-flash, anti-searchlight black paint job specifically for Southeast Asia. Where the G model was optimized for the nuclear mission, it had white anti-flash paint underneath, no external bomb racks, had to carry everything internal, which was basically 27 500 pound bombs. And there you can see a row of D models. And why I'd like to show this particular photograph is, is under the 
forward part of the fuselage there, you'll see the electronic countermeasures suite. Some of the antennas, it also has antennas similar back behind the bomb bay. It was modified with what was called the ALT-22 system, had five jammers that were optimized against the surface-to-air missiles that we would face, the SA-2 guideline missile. And there you see the G model. Uh, no pylons underneath the wings. Um, 488,000 pounds gross weight, so it had better range, but it also had wet wings, which means fuel in the wings, where the D didn't have it, other than in the outboard uh, rigs that it had on the very end of the wing. <clears throat> Both airplanes uh, had water-injected engines for max gross weight takeoffs. That water injection, which was water straight into the engines, uh, boosted the thrust per engine by about 2,500 pounds apiece. So you had an extra 20,000 pounds of thrust getting off the runway at max gross weight. Okay, ladies, I won't cover any more technical stuff. <laughs> there you see uh, D model taxiing out. Uh, <clears throat> In March 72, under the cover of bad weather, uh, the North Vietnamese invaded into the South with about 100,000 forces and about 600 tanks and artillery pieces. And they came down in three separate avenues. One which came across the DMZ between North and South Vietnam. Another one that came over through uh, Cambodia, Laos, and a third one which came over due west of Saigon. So that's uh, the forces that we were, were facing and trying to uh, negate with our missions called arc light missions, uh, supporting the South Vietnamese forces. There's a G model that um, we had 99, I think. We, we lost the G in the Pacific in July 72, where it had a catastrophic failure of airspeed indicators, and it crashed in the Pacific. So from the 100, we were down to 99. And of that 99, 58 of those Gs were modified with that latest ALT-22 system. The others were not, and they were extremely vulnerable, as we were about to find out. By the way, this was the airplane that I flew in on day eight that you will hear us go through the bomb run with you. So you'll be able to come with my crew on the biggest raid since World War II. And that's what North Vietnam looked like. This area that you see from 105 degrees uh, and 20 degrees 30 minutes north. That area is known as Route Pack 6. Vietnam, from South Vietnam all the way to North Vietnam, was broken into what was called route packages, one being down by the Delta in South Vietnam, two, three, and into North Vietnam, four in areas called Vinh and Hue, and then up in five, and six went all the way to the Chinese border. And this was the most heavily defended area in the world at that time. They had about 26 SA-2 sites, each with six missiles apiece. They had a few down by the DMZ, but the, the vast majority were up around Haiphong in the harbor, which is here, and then over in Hanoi. And that distance is about 60, 65 miles. And this is what a typical mission looked like going into South Vietnam, and they used that basic pattern for us to get into North Vietnam. And I'll just kind of point it out here for you. As you take off out of Guam, you climb out to about 30, 32,000 feet. There's a refueling track here for your 135 guys, refuelers, and you'd come down and catch a tanker and load on. In this case, we were loading on 58,000 pounds of gas on the 26th, um, and we were split. We were flying as wine two, so you had <coughs> wine one, the cell lead, 
he hit one tanker and you had two tankers and number three would hit that second tanker and we would catch both tankers. Well, uh, it would take us in to a timing box just off the, uh, just off the, the uh, coast of South Vietnam and then you'd turn in to your target to go back up north. And coming off target, you'd come out, <clears throat> climb out to about 42 to 43,000 feet up over the Pacific, you could now go over the Philippines where you couldn't go into the Philippines um, with bombs. You couldn't fly over the Philippines, but coming out, no problem, and climb up so you could conserve fuel and back on into Guam. So that was kind of a typical mission profile. So when they had the stand down on the 17th of December and ordered a maximum effort presidentially directed the guys out on the flight lines this was so typical every day also you'll notice look at all the the rain and the water about two o'clock in the afternoon the skies would open and it would rain like hell for about 30 minutes um, but they're loading uh, 750s there into uh, b-52d in the main bomb bay and the other guys are loading on what's called a jammer. That's what that is right there. And he'd be manually loading 500 pounders onto the wings of the D model. And we couldn't have done it again without this full maintenance package. Originally, Guam had been planned for about 3,000 personnel. We had 12,000 at Anderson Field Guam, living in Tent City, Tin City, uh, the uh, BOQs, you name it, we had every space occupied by, again, all the support personnel. It was a unique situation that we had there, and probably never to be duplicated again. Here they're loading drag chutes into the back of a B-52G, that's about a 40 48-foot drag chute or 44-foot drag chute? No, it's one of the two. <clears throat> and you use the drag chute normally when you land it. Occasionally you didn't use it, but uh, most of the time you did. And you can see on the cart, the drag chute's you know, bailed up there. And while all that was going on is they're preparing the fleet for this maximum effort, the crews on the 18th, about 11 o'clock, we're taking the first briefings in the briefing room at the Art Light Center. And it was just like out of the World War II movie, 12 o'clock high. They had, you came into the briefing room and they had the, on the, on the, uh, on the platform with curtains behind it and they drew the curtains back and the famous line, your target for today is Hanoi. And as you could tell, the crews were pretty intense at that point because B-52s had never been to Hanoi. They'd been into North Vietnam uh, occasionally, but mostly all done by the, uh, the DMZ. And of course, when they said that, you could hear a pin drop. You could look around the room as I did on day three, and no, there was guys that won't be, be coming back from this thing. So now, out in the flight line, the first three days were three separate waves, four hours apart. So they would be in on the target at seven o'clock in the evening, at midnight, and about four o'clock in the morning, with about 30 to 35 B-52s in a wave. Each wave had uh, the cells of three airplanes, and each one has, of course, separate call signs, usually colors, and uh, you'll see that here. And that's taxiing out on day one, wave one, and launching off. And you see the black smoke? What's the black smoke? Water. Water injection. 
That's right. Hope. So <laughs> the, the um, uh, EPA certainly didn't like uh, but it gave you all that increased thrust. And if you can see there, a little bit of the runway, that goes down for the first third of the runway. And the, the D model, again, uh, less power, different engines than what we had in the, in the G. And the S1 committed airspeed was exactly when in the takeoff roll? Right at the bottom of the dip. And when it came back up the other side, the airspeed meter would stop and back up a bit till you picked up speed, and then it picked up and off you went. The nice part was that of the crew on board, the radar navigator and the navigator went down if they had to eject, where the co-pilot and the pilot and the EW went up. The gunner, if he was in a D, he had to, had to manually bail out. If he was in the G, he was up front and he could eject but you needed 400 feet and 120 knots to get out from down below. So instantly over to the, the Guam cliff, you had 600 feet, so that was okay. Now let's take you out to the flight line and watch the launches.
So as you saw, um, lost uh, 11 aircraft in the first three days. No, a number of those aircraft, six G models, five of the six were unmodified. I remember I talked about that, that those things were very uh, risky to put those up in that high threat area. SAC didn't think that. They got their, their uh, lunch handed to them in those first three days. I was day three, wave three. We were coming down on the bomb run and the wave lead had just released his bombs and he got hit by two SAMs and they were punching out. And all you hear over, over the guard frequency is the emergency locator beacons going off. Um, straw two, a D model had been hit but they managed to make the fence, which is basically the border between Vietnam and Laos, Cambodia, and they ejected. And then back behind us was another cell, tan cell, and they got hit also, uh, but prior to the target, and they didn't get their bombs out, they crashed five miles short. And only one person got out, the gunner uh, ejected, and the others uh, were unfortunately uh, not able to get out of the airplane. So we lost three out of my 21. So the change in tactics came. We had a 36-hour stand down over Christmas Day. And we went through what the results were. And we, we just told them we had to do something totally different. And we've been trained to do some of these things that were planned in for the 26, which was not separate into three big waves four hours apart. Let's hit it in one big wave, 120 B-52s coming in on 10 target complexes, nose to nose, altitude separation, time separation, and you can see up here, and I'll try and point it out, you had four waves, two coming in this way, two coming in this way, so when you came in, but altitude separation, you had my wave, which is up here, I was in wine cell coming in up north at the Thai, Thai New Yen uh, Railroad and Power Plant area. And then two waves over here, one nose to nose in the Haiphong area. So seven waves, and this was a, the huge change. One difference in direction. Um, on target, you can see that from Guam D's, Guam G's and Utapau D's, you can see up here, and time on target, oh, 2230. Opal, 2230, 2230, 2230. Everybody off target by 2245. And then all the support aircraft we had at one go, which was a hundred and some odd support aircraft you can see there in doing uh, chaff bundles, doing Iron Hand, which is anti-radiation missiles against the SAM guidance radars and acquisition radars. Uh, EB-66s, which is again ECM support, Navy A-6s, which are really good. So we had over 230 airplanes over North Vietnam. And we all knew that th this would either make it or break it. And basically it confused the North Vietnamese about where to aim and you know, where, where to shoot. They did take down two B-52s out of this, but it convinced them to get back to the negotiating tables. And within a short time, by the end of January, we had a peace treaty. But I'm gonna take you on our bomb rate on the 26 on this that you just saw. And why 
10-minute thrill ride, e-ticket e ride at Disneyland. <laughs> um, it still makes the hair on the back of your head stand up. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, um, who would have believed, 50 years, wow. But at this point, I wanted to make sure that those who didn't make it back from linebacker were remembered. And I do that. Those of you who were at the Guam Club, do you remember the band that we had at the Guam Club in 1972-73? The full band. Yeah, the dropouts. Do you remember the lead singer? No. Yolanda Reyes. No. 
I recorded this music at the Guam Club, and the song is American Trilogy, made famous by Elvis Presley. Oh, I wish I was in the land of cotton. Oh, times they are not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away.
presentation like that 50 years ago. And now to come to the moment of the toast, I think you would be interested to know the advice I got from some of the senior officers when I asked them how the toast should be proposed. And to a man, each one of them said, do not propose it to us. We have been toasted and we appreciate the great welcome that we have received. And most of them referred to the missing in action, to those who have been killed in action, to those who have served in Vietnam, to those who are serving today all over the world, to those who wear the uniform of the United States proudly, as they have worn it so proudly. And of course, I could go on and on about the men that these strong men and stout-hearted men would like for us to recognize. I think there is one group, and I will not propose the toast to them tonight because I have another group that I think deserves that accolade, but one group that I would like to mention particularly. The most difficult decision that I have made since being president was on December the 18th of last year. And many occasions in that 10-day period after the decision was made when I wondered whether anyone in this country really supported it. But I can tell you this, after having met each one of our honored guests this evening, after having talked to them, I think that all of us would like to join in a round of applause for the brave men that took those B-52s in and did the job. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. One more time, please, a round of applause and hoo-ahs for Lieutenant Colonel Howard Butcher. We are grateful for his time and service to bring our Linebacker 2 legacy to remembrance from Vietnam to VR on this special day, March 29, 2023, the 50th anniversary of the release of our POWs back home. Our thanks again to the multitudes of people that donated their time and resources to bring this event right here to Echo Vets and Second Life and to the internet to be shared globally. This presentation is now available as a YouTube video entitled From Vietnam to VR, the 50th anniversary of Linebacker 2 and is published by Lit Global. We encourage you to look into the description for a plethora of links for more immersive experiences and to learn more about Linebacker 2. Learn more about us here at EchoVets.org and our veteran supporters. Please stay tuned for more great content and events coming at you from EchoVets Armed Forces Museum right here in Second Life.
Go to silver way.